Hey, thanks, Lauren, and thanks to the 168 of you who are joining today. Um, so today I want to follow up on uh, Trey's discussion and kind of dive, dive deeper and uh, give you all a bit of an experience of how user experience has been applied in my research. And then I will also apply the concept of user experience to the uh, design of wayfinding elements. And in particular, um, we're going to see how the Dutch have innovated in their wayfinding design and how wayfinding can then be applied in the North American context. So uh, let, let's start with a bit of a background, right? Um, so uh, Lauren has distributed this earlier. Um, there, there's one video here and two papers uh, that I've authored. And this kind of will serve as a background for my talk. Um, so go ahead, take a look at those papers. Uh, and if you're, uh, if you're not really following along in this talk, uh, you can always go back and just uh, rewatch the YouTube video, uh, especially uh, those of you who are joining us on the recording of this webinar. Okay, so uh, it's really good to have you here. And uh, today I'm going to extend on what Trey has already introduced to you about the hierarchy of needs. And uh, this hierarchy of needs kind of illustrates uh, what, what we are looking for as bicycle uh, infrastructure designers. And I would argue also as urban planners, right? Um, at, at the top, you see awe and enjoyment and reliability. And the bottom, you see the basic requirements of safety and security. So what I will argue in this talk is that as we move towards the top of the hierarchy, as we get towards awe and, and, and a, a good experience and, and something very pleasant and enjoyable, we have to move towards more qualitative methods. We go from a science of design, which provides basic functionality and security, to an art of design. And that's uh, perhaps something that urban designers are very comfortable with and, and UX designers, of, uh, as Trey has mentioned, is also quite comfortable with, but maybe something that um, could hinder the technical, uh, more technically minded of um, you, you on this webinar today. So let's, uh, let's see how these two connect and then how art and engineering can kind of work together uh, with both research and practice to make bicycle infrastructure better. So here's the proposition that I want to make. In transport planning, we have a severe problem of A to Bism, right? And what does A to Bism mean? It, it means that we assume that the origin and destination matter more than the journey itself. We assume that the journey has negative utility. But that is kind of odd, isn't it? That the journey has negative utility. What if it is? awe and enjoyment on the journey. Doesn't that mean the journey has positive utility? How does that get reflected in our transport models? Doesn't that kind of throw a wrench into what we've been discussing or the model of which we think transport works? So I want to discuss that a bit further about this idea in both research and practice. And the first uh, item I want to bring to your attention is the idea of preferences and motivation. Okay, so you see highlighted in orange here, preferences and motivation. What's different about these two concepts? I would argue that the difference is that preferences can be obtained from uh, the actions of people. For example, if you pick bike route A over bike route B, you're revealing a preference. But motivation is so not so easy to study. We may know precisely what cyclists prefer in general by doing a large sample GPS study, for example, but why they do what they do is going to forever remain a black box. And that is the human conundrum, if we will. We cannot mind read how other cyclists feel or how people pick their routes. We just know the results. But how do we design for this? How do we design for motivation? And what can we use um, motivation and the idea of a black box to increase our understanding of bicycle infrastructure? So uh, let me take a stab from a research perspective, right? Right now, cycling research is currently divided between revealed and stated preference, right? Revealed, stated preference. Uh, revealed preference is something like a GPS study. So a GPS study, for example, would take uh, your cell phone, which is uh, what everyone carries these days, and, and use uh, an app on your cell phone to take like a thousand routes, for example. And we see that out of these thousand 
600 take root B, 200 take root C, and maybe uh, 100 takes root <laughs> B. Okay, so that doesn't quite up, add up to 1,000, but this is, this is the left part of this chart, right? What about stated preferences up here on, on the right side? What, what, what is it here about stated preferences that makes it so difficult? So uh, if you see at the top, we have the A-B test. We can ask people about the scenarios, right? So what they would do if they could, which they aren't at the moment because they're answering a question on a piece of paper. Um, and, and we're trying to figure out what is revealed preference good for and what kind of uh, things that stated preferences are good for. Um, and my argument is that revealed preferences really uh, kind of reveals people's choices and preferences. But as we move towards stated preference, the real value in doing stated preference research is actually in getting at people's motivations. So in going beyond whether it's A to B, because that's been covered by our GPS studies already, and going more into uh, scenarios and asking people why they prefer what they prefer, right? If GPS study enroaches on the territory of revealed preference, then we should be actually taking stated preference to uh, answer our deeper and more fundamental questions about why people cycle, right? And what makes for a good cycling experience. So what do we already know from GPS studies? We can already kind of have a hunch and I'm going to use the, the researchers of uh, Joseph Broach, Jennifer Dill and uh, John Gleeb here uh, in their paper um, to kind of show you what GPS studies have already shown us. And this was already done, you know, before the widespread adoptions of, uh, of smartphones so December 2012. Right. Uh, and, and they state, right, uh, using 1,449 non-exercise utilitarian trips, they've estimated uh, a root choice model. Right. And the findings suggest that cyclists are sensitive to the effects of distance, turning frequency, uh, slope, right, intersection control and traffic volumes. In addition, cyclists appear to place relatively high value on off street bike paths, enhanced neighborhood bikeway with traffic calming features and bridge facilities. I, I would say that none of you on this call are very surprised at the results of these GPS studies. And if you're a cyclist, they should probably won't surprise you either, right? So if you have the experience of cycling and you know uh, what bad infrastructure is, it's not difficult to infer what good infrastructure is. It's, um, but perhaps what's more interesting to me as a field of research is the motivation, right? Is the motivation of why people prefer what they prefer. And that's something that we'll get into in a moment. So let's go back to our slides here, okay? So GPS, I would argue that we're looking to innovate in the field of outside in, uh, sorry, inside out methodologies, right? So we can observe people in their natural environment on the move, but we can also look inside out, ask people what they prefer. Um, and, and how do we extract that information in a meaningful way, right? So people may say, mm, I like trees along my route. Okay. How do we translate I like trees and greenery into the design of bicycle infrastructure? After all, there's a variety of ways to arrange bikes, uh, trees and, and, and flowers and, and the bike path. So this is where we get into a bit more of a design challenge, right? It's not so easy to ask exactly the elements that people prefer. Okay, so this is where it, the idea of bicycle highways got me interested, right? The European Cycling uh, Federation uh, says that bicycle highways should be at least three miles long, uh, 10 feet if one dire directional, 13 feet if bi-directional, uh, separated from, you know, motorized traffic and everything else listed here. But these are really just necessary, but not sufficient conditions for a great cycling experience. It doesn't tell you how to awe people, how to make cycling a, a great experience. It just tells you what the basics are. <clears throat> so here's the, the basics again in, in a diagram form, right? Basics. I, I want to focus us though, to the, uh, the more, uh, going beyond the basics, the, the more qualitative and, you know, uh, Ewing and handy, uh, who, who does urban design research, they, they, they kind of call this like, what, what are the um, un, undefinable features, right? What, what's, what's the remainder uh, after we do the basics? And I think 
the, the answer to this, I think the answer to this question comes in the users, right? By studying people going from inside out, what is important for people who use bikes? And as Trey have said, well, this is on the bottom right, uh, uh, in terms of what are the user preferences of different groups, right? Okay. So how do we design bicycle highways? This is what I found interesting. This is from European practitioners, but I might as well be in North America too. I mean, I, uh, I, I grew up in Canada and I've made numerous visits to the U S right. So, uh, we're probably a, a highway society, so we know how to build highways really well. Um, but, uh, what kind of logic are we employing is the logic that we use to build highways, the same logic that we use to design an urban street. And if that is so, then we have to kind of figure out and decide in which logic do we want to build bicycle infrastructure? Do you want to build it according to social logic or traffic logic? Do we want to move from people from A to B or do we want to design for a good experience, right? And it makes a key difference in how we conceptualize this. Is it an, an art or is it mechanics, right? Is it a laminar flow applied to clover leaves or is it something else? So it's bicycle infrastructure like this, but scaled down. Right, we can build <laughs> 50, 60 feet highways. So is this scaled down or uh, is it more like uh, urban design? So, and if you were to ask an architect, right? Uh, right, this is kind of the, the sneak Q and A's that might be coming up it, is what, what does it take to build a beautiful building? Um, I would argue that, um, you know, if you look in the design literature, it's someone has said it's a tension between, you know, uniformity and, uh, and variation, right? That's something that's what creates great architecture, right? These, uh, these windows here are uniform, but they also have they're, they're variations on the theme, you know, and, and that's very different from what, what this is, right? This is, this is uniformity with no, not much attention paid to aesthetics unless you look back into the 1930s into the the parkways movement right when bicycles sorry when highways were being built for recreational purposes so what is it more like now as i advance to the next slide for those of you who watched the youtube video already you'll know this next slide is as i ask you this what is of the of the previous two slides what is this more like right <laughs> and it's literally a, a bicycle highway which um, if, if this is the utopia that we're designing for, then I would argue this is a, a bit problematic because I personally would not want to cycle here, right? And if we're designing bicycle highways like this, we're definitely using the A to B logic. And this is thanks to the uh, bicycle highway that they are they were building in 2014. I believe it's now finished in uh, the Rhine region in uh, Germany, so they're uh, by the Rhine River. So let's look uh, a bit into what I've just said applied, right? Let's talk about wayfinding. So this is, uh, I wanna kind of give you a, a practical example of what I'm trying to talk about. And yes, that's me. <laughs> so uh, we went, we did some studies, uh, a, pe uh, a piece of research over the summer of 2014 with this question in mind, right? What makes users identify a cycle highway and what role does wayfinding play in e-bikes user, uh, user? <laughs> You bike users cycle highway experience because uh, as we know that this from the sales data that in fact e-bike users are now sorry e-bikes constitute the um, more sales than conventional bicycles i believe that is in terms of dollars um, not units but still that's that means the bulk of new revenue is coming from the sale of e-bikes so we should probably kind of figure out how these can uh, these new vehicles can be integrated into our existing uh, infrastructure, right? So this is the question and we set out to uh, answer this question using qualitative methods, right? We'll come back to the findings in a bit, but I want to give you, you know, give it away before, before you have to sit through all this. So here are the, the main findings before I get started, we'll come back to them. Okay. What did we do? Uh, we, we, we took a 11 mile, uh, uh, bicycle highway connecting these two cities, uh, in the Netherlands, they're, a uh, about 11 miles apart. We thought it was great because uh, that's about uh, the, the maximum distance that people kind of are willing to travel by bike. Uh, if you're a commuter, that's e equal to about one hour on a e-bike. Um, and this was a, a bicycle highway that was being developed. So some parts of it are um, up to standard and then 
as of the current day, I think the whole thing has now been signed so and completed infrastructure wise. Uh, we, we did a qualitative interview. So on the go, we did, uh, we, we interviewed people as they were riding 12 e-bike users, you know, in pairs. Uh, and we also looked at the social aspect. So if they were cycling together, um, how, how they interact with each other, were they, were they able to talk along the way? For example, did talking to each other then distract them from, you know, um, wayfinding elements, et cetera, et cetera. So, uh, those were all kind of the, the things that we were curious about. Right. Uh, if you're curious about Dutch bicycle uh, infrastructure wayfinding, this is the current standards. Uh, the whole kind of the part, uh, the purpose of this research was also to develop new standards for, um, you know, basically cyclists who are going faster. So these these would be typical of what you'll see in the Netherlands. Um, and we took uh, two case studies. So so one was uh, this thing at the top here, which is um, some more of this shapely kind of sign and then uh, the second one is this uh, you know more square kind of thing so we took half the route uh was one concept and then the other half was the other concept we kind of we're, we're also trying to figure out not only do you prefer the old or the new one but also in between the two new ones which one do you prefer right and uh th this kind of also forms its own branding strategy in a way right so um so one set is on the left, another set is on the right, and these would be used together, right, uh, as, as um, a whole. And uh, basically we found that people overwhelmingly prefer the new signage. Um, we'll take a brief tour in, a, in, in just a second. Um, but in addition, they also preferred this one, you know, the, the one on, on the right, the concept uh, Snell. So the concept plus was more alike uh, the old one, and the concept Snell was more like uh, it was more innovative. So I think people preferred the one on the right. And, you know, so let's, before we take you to the conclusions, um, I want to give you like a brief tour of kind of what we're talking about since, uh, you know, we're all stuck inside, we'd rather be outside. So let's see if we, I can bring you along on a brief tour. Right here, if you look on the right here, you see these little arrows? That's on the bottom. So these are like the three warning signs um, before you make a left. So so forward, there's going to be a left turn. And then these, these three signs kind of warn you before it's going to happen. And then as you move a bit more, then you get to this warning sign, which if I play the video, there it is on the right, right? You see that? Then that tells you which way to go. So you have a series of preparations, kind of like uh, what you would see on, 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 a, on a highway, right? You get some warning before you actually go to your exit. This is kind of gives you some warning before you actually make a turn. Um, pause again up there. Right? That's how small it was and how, how much higher up it was. So it's very not at eye level if you're a cyclist. Um, and it's not very easy to see. So I, I find with the old sign that you really have to kind of stop to, to really squint and see what's there, right? Um, as long as you have the, the route finding correct, as long as it's clear, you know, uh, where you're supposed to go to get to your destination, you know, you, you can have uh, your, your pick and choose of what kind of infrastructure you want, right? And this is a low traffic, uh, traffic calm street, right, in the countryside. And then, you know, here's some paving, forest, and then you get into more of the urban areas, right, with trees and stuff. And you can see very few cars. There's no cars at all, right, in, in this, whole, um, this whole journey yet. Um, and then you transition back to uh, dedicated bus bicycle infrastructure. So it's very seamless uh, along the journey, but it's, it's typically the wayfinding and the transitions that make the whole thing kind of work, right? And now you're on a colored edge lane road. Um, and then, you know, as we get close to the city, the end of this journey, and then I'll wrap this up. Uh, so a green line, and then we get kind of to a bridge, and then this is much more urban, you can see. Um, so uh, what are some takeaways from this? And then I'll hand it back to Lauren for Q&A. Um, some, some takeaways, you know, design matters, right? Design matters. Uh, signs alone, as you can see, the infrastructure kind of is, is there, but it's not coherent, I would argue. Signs alone go a long way. Uh, education is key, right? And clear cycling infrastructure, you know, improves cyclists' level of relaxation. So that's something interesting, right? 
not something revealed in the GPS, but it's something that you can get quite accurately if you ask people uh, along the way how they feel at each point. So uh, let's wrap this up by returning to this pyramid, right? So we have the Maslow hierarchy of needs, uh, right? Uh, where we started with, and then Alfonso adapted this to walking needs, um, kind of conceptualized this as uh, limits, right, on the bottom versus, uh, versus urban form on the top, right? And then I kind of was playing with this idea that you get from like quantitative limits to qualitative enablers, right? So you kind of, if, if something is you know, 50 kilometers away, it's hard to make the argument that you'll cycle there. Um, if, if the bike path is like 50% longer than you know, the similar driving route, it's hard to convince people to ride there. If it's not safe, right, then uh, it's only the, f the fearless will go. Uh, and as you move up the pyramid, it becomes harder to deal with, right? Like, for example, what if uh, we're trying to design something pleasurable? How, how do we calculate for that? Right, and then here is overlaid onto uh, the bicycle user experience scheme, uh, going from, I think, almost the, kind of the same idea, right, from basic needs over to, to qualitative indicators and qualitative ways of talking about bicycle experience. So, uh, going back to your original question, right, which was uh, the original statement was asking about um, how you feel about cycling. I want to bring back up the menti, which is uh, what you answered in the beginning. And as you can see, right, you answered safety, comfort, connectivity, all ages, separation, you know, access. Some of these, actually the, the big points that you've mentioned, you know, safety is a funny one. We try and quantify it, but really in terms of human psychology, it's really much more about uh, how safe people feel right like airplanes are relatively safe but it's it's the stuff of nightmares right so and i think you know cycling can be definitely made quantitatively safer but it's you know much more difficult to measure the, the near misses that cause people to to fear the the environment that they're in so i'll uh, i'll wrap up and uh leave you something to think about while uh we go to q a with lauren thanks for your time and uh talk to you in a bit